Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Let me begin by thanking the organizers very much for inviting me here to come to this really interesting conference in these beautiful surroundings. So what I want to talk about today is at the sort of singularities of Teichmüller harmonic map flow and really what can happen when you try to take a surface, flow it to turn it into a minimal surface. So what can happen is that you can run into some problems or rather as mathematicians we will probably say some inter interesting phenomena but what I tr will try to convince you is that the problems are not too bad and you can continue a flow canonically all the way until you arrive at your minimal surface. And on the way of doing this, there might be little problems, but all of these little problems just cause you to lose the objects that you're actually try, trying to find. So all you lose are minimal surfaces. So roughly the sort of half a minute version of my talk is what we do is we introduce a PDE that changes maps from a surface into whatever target you like changes them toward parametrizations of minimal surfaces and it works. But you have to do some work. So the plan for today's talk is that I want to in introduce what this PDE is. We call it the Teichmüller harmonic map flow. So what it is, it's basically uh, somewhere in between of trying to flow with something like mean curvature flow. We don't try to do that, but we try to flow with a gradient flow that is designed to find critical points of area, but at the same time that is designed to have many of the nice features of harmonic map flow, namely being much more regular in two-dimensional cases and being also much more regular when you have a nice background, something like Euclidean space or something negatively curved. And after defining the flow, I will want to talk a little bit of what happens and in particular of what can happen when you run into singularities. So let me start by setting up the flow. Oops. So so for all of this talk I want to consider a domain which will always be two dimensional. So for me let's always have M be a surface And for the most part, you can think of this as a closed surface. Let me just remark, it could also be, for example, a cylinder. And hopefully in the future, more general surfaces with boundaries, but our theory is most developed when we have a closed surface. And also we can assume without loss of generality that the thing is orientable, because otherwise we could just pass to the double cover and do the same thing again. So this is the domain over which I will parameterize my maps, uh, my surfaces, and then I have really the space in which I'm looking for minimal surfaces. NGN is just any Riemannian manifold, say um, complete, but really any dimension. No restrictions other than, yeah, just complete. Then what do we want to do? So we, we're given some kind of initial map u0 that goes from m into n. And now the question is, how can we evolve u0 to get in the end a minimal surface? And what I really mean, a minimal immersion, possibly with branch points, if such a thing exists, or just more generally, it might also be a constant if you start out with a surface in Euclidean space. So how should you go about changing your surface U0? And I just want to stress here, I'm looking for minimal immersions. The flow will in particular not preserve being an embedding. It will not even in the meantime preserve being an immersion but the thing you end up in the end should be a branched minimal immersion. 
So how do we do this? Now, the first thing coming to mind is if you want to change something to find a critical point, you might want to follow the negative gradient and then hope that in the end, as a mathematician, as time goes to infinity, you end up at the critical point of area. Now, as an analyst, area is not your best friend because it's not all that nice. On the other hand, energy is much nicer. So the idea of the flow was to say, I really want to exploit the good properties of the Dirichlet energy, and I'm willing to pay a price for it. And the price we will pay is that we do not just have to change maps from M to N, but we will also have to change the geometry of the domain M. Now this might sound a little bit scary initially, but actually it turns out to be a really good thing, because if I just keep a domain fixed here, and try to flow to something like a minimal immersion, then there's a lot of settings where you know from start this has no chance of succeeding because your domain has the wrong topology. For example, you might want to flow in, from a cylinder into Rn in a situation where you simply don't have a cylindrical minimal surface up there that spans your boundary curves. So changing the geometry can actually have good aspects, but of course will need you to do some careful analysis. So what is the idea? So the idea is to say we want to flow by the negative gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy. So E, which is much, much nicer than area, but of course, in order to define the Dirichlet energy, I can't just define this as an energy of a map because I have just some kind of domain here, M is a surface without any extra structure. I need at the very least a conformal structure or in this situation, let me just put a metric on it. So we measure this Dirichlet energy with respect to G, a metric, and we consider this metric G to be an independent variable that we are going to flow. So G is not the induced metric of the map, but it is just any metric out there. And we consider this on the space of all, so pairs of more or less independent variables, U, G. U goes from M into N, G, N. Only regularity we need is it's good enough that this is defined, so H1 is good enough. And G is a metric on the domain. We're evolving G, yes. Absolutely. That's a, that's one of the major things you have to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to flow U N G by the negative gradient. That's basically the price you have to pay for working with the nice energy is that you get two variables that you have to flow. Now, if you do this, well, what would you get just by this idea? So roughly we will get that we want to evolve DTU by minus gradient of the energy of U. So this is the tension field, of course. And depending on how you want to view this, if I consider N a submanifold of Euclidean space, this would just be Laplacian of U plus the second fundamental form term. So a nice parabolic equation with a bit of a nonlinearity. And then you would want to evolve dTGU by the negative gradient of the energy with respect to G. Now what is that going to be? So the easiest way of writing this down is as the real part of something complex. And this complex thing measures how conformal your map is. So phi of UG here is the Hopf differential that we've already seen before. So I can write this in local coordinates as ux squared minus uy squared minus 2i ux uy dz squared, where x and y are simply isothermal coordinates of the g. So if g is rho squared dx squared plus dy squared. So this is the first idea that comes to mind, that I want to flow u with the full gradient of the energy I want to flow G with the full gradient of the energy with respect to the metric. Uh, G is implicit in the coordinates here. Yeah. 
in the coordinate. So basically, phi of u g, it depends only on the conformal type of g. And you can compute it in local coordinates by taking isothermal coordinates from them and then computing this difference. So it basically measures, if I look at the pullback of gn and compare whether this is, it's a part of this and it measures how conformal your map is. So this vanishes if and only if um, these two are the same and this is equal to zero. So with respect to these coordinates, so it's, this is equal to zero if and only if u is conformal as a map from mg into ngn. Yeah. Okay, so this is the first idea that comes to mind and you can write this down, you can even prove short time existence for this, but then that's the second part of the talk. You run into problems very quickly and you run into pretty bad problems because one of the things you know without even evolving the metric and um, harmonic map flow, so if G is fixed, this thing up here is just harmonic map flow. It's well behaved, but it can form singularities where U blows up in anything which is stronger than grad U L2 squared. So grad U L P is not bounded when P is bigger than two, even just for this flow, for harmonic map flow, which in practice would, you would mean that you would evolve your metric by something which is quadratic in the gradient. So roughly speaking, you evolve your metric by an L1 element, which is not quite what you want. So you would expect for a metric, the regularity you would aim for is sort of C2. And if you do PDEs between L1 and C2, there's a huge difference. As we will see, if we set up this flow correctly, there's actually no difference at all between L1 and C2 estimates. But that doesn't work if you just take the rough approach of saying, I flow in this whole set. Because at this stage, we've said, well, we want to find critical points of this, but we're completely ignoring the structure of this energy and we're ignoring that this energy has a lot of symmetries. So what we should really do is we should take this flow but mod out by the symmetries and what we should do is instead of a rough flow is we should take only the part of the gradient which we need which is orthogonal to the symmetries. Now, if you do this, there's one important difference to the equation, and that comes in the form of a projection operator in here. And this projection operator, PH, goes from the space of all quadratic differentials. So objects like here, function times dz squared, into the set of all holomorphic quadratic differentials. Now the reason behind this is the following, so let me just explain this. What do I mean by dividing out the symmetries? So we have symmetries, we're in 2D, so we can identify UG with U and any conformal change of G because the energy is conformally invariant. So that gets us rid of already some problematic problems because we can say without loss of generality, let's just evolve G in the space of constant curvature metrics. So all metrics with Gauss curvature, one for the sphere, zero for the torus, and minus one for everything else. So that gets rid of some problems. And then we have a second symmetry, which is just if I take two U and Gs, and I modify them both in the same way, I still get the same energy. So I can identify U composed with F, with F star G. So using this means I can flow orthogonally to the lead derivatives. And now if we divide out all of these lead derivatives, what do we get? So let me remark here that if I look at the space of constant curvature metrics, 
dependence based on the constant curvature metric splits up nicely into Lie derivatives, direct sum L2 orthogonal here really, of the real part of the holomorphic quadratic differentials. So because of that, I don't have to flow the metric in that direction, but I just have to flow in that direction. So in practice, this means a tiny change of the addition of one projection operator, which has a huge effect on regularity theory. Because we all know holomorphic objects are great. If I have a holomorphic function, you give me a bound on the L1 norm, and a bound on like how big a ball I can work on, I give you a bound on the CK norm. And that's exactly what happens here. Because we have these holomorphic objects, just standard complex analysis as we teach the undergraduates, we know that as long as the injectivity radius of my domain is less, greater or equal to some constant, we can bound the CK norm of G times the L1 norm of the, uh, by the L1 norm of the thing I project. And phi is an element which is quadratic in the gradient, so this is just bounded by the energy, which is, of course, decreasing along the flow. So by introducing these symmetries, what I end up with is I end up with some kind of evolution equation where I have a first component which changes around the map, changes it around in a similar way as harmonic map flow does, so that looks promising, should be reasonably regular, as long as my metric doesn't do stupid things. And I get an evolution equation for the metric, which again has very nice regularity properties as long as the injectivity radius doesn't go. So that gives you a nice PDE and makes you think that this should be quite interesting to study. At the same time, I started out talking about wanting to find minimal surfaces, and now I talk about flowing energy around, uh, flowing with the gradient flow of the energy. So let me just mention that this actually makes sense if you're trying to find minimal immersions. So let me make a remark. So what is this flow trying to do? So if we look at the critical points, the stationary points of this flow, we have that dTU equals zero is equivalent to U having tangent equal to zero. So U being a harmonic map. While the stationary points, when the metric doesn't move, this equal to zero, this implies that phi has no holomorphic part. Now importantly, U being a harmonic map implies that phi is holomorphic. So together the two of them give you that U is conformal. Because it has no holomorphic part and it is holomorphic if I'm a stationary point. So I get a conformal map and I get a harmonic map. So together this implies that U is a critical point of the area, and this is either the trivial one, u is constant, or the interesting one, u is a branched minimal image. So the flow, if it works, if we have solutions for all times, because it's a gradient flow, it should converge, at least along a suitable sequence, to a critical point of the energy, and that critical point will be the objects that we encounter. So that's at the very rough level, and if life is good, for example, if you have a situation of a non-positively curved target, and you have a situation of a map which is incompressible, then you can just take this flow, run it forever, it is smooth, you can have a subsequence and it converges as t goes off to infinity. In the more general situation, there's more work to be done. And so I want to explain to you first at the rough level, probably with quite a lot of pictures and not a lot of details, of what the flow actually does if it runs into singularities. 
and then how we continue past these singularities. And in the later part of the talk, I then want to focus on some of the more precise descriptions of what's actually going on. Yes? Uh, well, the thing is, you will if you start with something which is a critical point of area, you will just stay there. So you cannot expect that the flow modifies in general things to something nicer than what a class of just general critical point has. The question is whether you avoid the branch conversions somehow. Start with something I would not necessarily expect it. I mean might depend on the stabilities, but it is really a flow which is exploiting that we don't have to care about embeddedness and branchness, and in between it will not be an immersion or anything like that, but uses sort of the freedom of doing that. Yes, yeah. Okay, so let me now try to explain roughly description of the behavior of the flow. And uh, before I do that, I should mention two special cases that I haven't mentioned yet. So um, one of the special cases is the case of the sphere. In the case of the sphere, there's no holomorphic quadratic differentials except zero. So it is just going to turn into harmonic map flow. And we already know uh, that, of course, harmonic map flow changes things into minimal, into minimal spheres in that situation. Uh, in the case of the torus, that's also a special case. So for T2, and this projection onto holomorphic quadratic differentials means that your flow of metrics evolves only in a 2D set of surfaces, because in that situation, the map that maps a metric to this real part of holomorphic guys is, a integrable, uh, is an integrable thing, so you just end up in a two-dimensional situation. And for the torus case, our flow agrees with the flow of a thing Lee and Liu from an uh, Inventionis paper of 2006, where we just get basically harmonic map flow plus two ODEs uh, for the metric G. So here in the following, I want to focus on higher genus situations uh, and want to draw the corresponding pictures in particular. So what do we do in this situation? So most of what I'm going to draw is the behavior of what the domain does because we actually change the domain in time. So we start out with a domain, say this is my genus two surface, this is my mg naught. Here I go into my target that will just always stay fixed and I start with a u naught. Now I can flow this for a while and then I might run into a singularity. And then depending on how this singularity looks like, the, this, the picture is quite different. So let's first talk about the simple type of singularities. So let's assume that T goes to a singular time, but the injectivity radius remains the same, uh, remains bounded away from zero. So in a situation like that, the domain really doesn't care overly much. Because the domain says, well, I'm, a ho I'm evolving by holomorphic objects defined on things which have bounded injectivity radius. So my velocity, dtg, is bounded in ck. If you go close enough to the singular time, it just looks like the domain doesn't move at all. So the domain just stays roughly the same when t is approximately t, but still a little bit less than t. However, the map causes a singularity. And the map causes singularities as you know them from harmonic map flow. And that is the only thing that can happen is you can have concentration of energy on tiny little domains. So what happens is that I might have a point here and around this point I have a little circle. And on this circle, my u of t on a ball b r of t, say x of t, this is greater or equal to some epsilon naught even though the radius r of t shrinks to zero. 
So in terms of behavior, that means at the first level that if we pass to the limit, t goes to infinity, then this bit shrinks down, so this bit is really lost when we pass to the limit. So we have that u of t will converge to a limit, u, bar, u of t, but this is only weak h1 conversions because we have points where energy is lost, but at these points, the thing actually looks like a minimal sphere. So if you do your standard rescaling, as in harmonic map flow, so you rescale this up to a big ball, and then you consider the corresponding maps up here, so these u, say, of ti, and then you rescale x minus some p of ti over r of ti, then these objects converge to an omega, which is from R2 into N, and this omega is harmonic. So of course R2 is pretty much the same as the sphere, namely the sphere without a point. So what you really lose here is you lose harmonic maps from the sphere into your target. These are again minimal surfaces. So we have this convergence and we can say the only thing we lose are omega j's, which go from S2 into NGN, and these are minimal, possibly branched, minimal uh, immersions. So here, my picture here is a bit simplistic. I might have energy concentrating at different scales, so you have to do various rescalings, and what you really do is you attract, uh, extract the so-called bubble tree of harmonic maps. But you can show that if you take, and this is all work already known in the 90s for harmonic map flow, that if I take u of t and I subtract, I subtract suitably scaled bubbles, then the convergence to this is actually strong H1, so you don't lose any energy, and you also don't lose necks, so everything is nice and connected. So you really can say the only thing you lose are minimal immersions. Now what you do in this situation is you basically just take those guys, you pack them in a box, set them aside, and say, well, my flow hasn't really done its job yet because I still have my u of t, and there's no reason why this big u of big t should be anywhere near a minimal surface, so we should continue flowing with that u of t and see what happens afterwards. So, you can do that again, you might run into more of these singularities, and then you might end up with time going to infinity having a global solution. And if you actually never have injectivity radius going to zero, you get a very similar picture also as you send time to infinity. So in this situation where the injectivity radius doesn't go to zero, you just end up with lots of boxes of minimal spheres, and you end up with a minimal surface at the end. So you've decomposed what you started with into a minimal surface from the parameterized over the original domain plus a few minimal spheres. So that's sort of the good situation. Now, the more complicated situation if, is if the injectivity radius is not bounded away from zero, but rather goes to, goes to zero. So the other situation, what if t goes to t singularity? and injectivity radius of mg of t goes to zero. Well, first of all, let me just recall that dealing Mumford compactness result or the differential geometric version tells you that if I have any sequence mgi hyperbolic surfaces, so that the injectivity radius of MGI goes to zero, then there exists a limit, limiting object, sigma h, which is a punctured, complete hyperbolic surface. And there exists geodesics, sigma ij, these are collapsing geodesics, in my MGI, so that if I pull back, uh, and there's diffeomorphisms, Fj, which go from my limiting guy into M without the 
union of the collapsing geodesics. So that after pulling back my matrix with the diffeomorphisms, they converge nicely to my limiting object on sigma. So that's the statement of formulas and really the picture is that if I have a surface whose injectivity radius goes to zero, I must have geodesics which collapse. And because I'm hyperbolic, collapsing of geodesics means there's a stretching out of the neighborhood around there. So I might have a genus two guy which this guy stretches out. So here's my collapsing geodesic. I might have more bits stretching out just for the fun of it. Maybe something like that. So here's another collapsing geodesic. Now in this situation, what the limit is going to look like is a puncture torus here, and then I have a sphere which has three punctures going out. Oops. Something, like, something like that. So this is my limiting surface against which I converge after passing to a subsequence and pulling back by diffeomorphisms in the dilling mumford compactness theorem. So the minimal surface. We are not even, yeah, we will see them later. We will, yes. So this is just that the behavior of, we first need to work out what the domain actually does before we can go back to the maps. Yeah. So this is roughly what the domain does in general. Now, if you were to have this just rough picture at, as a kind of domain for your surface, you wouldn't really know which parts converge in what sense because you have diffeomorphisms and all of that. So what you hope is that you actually get quite a bit more because you're not just having any old sequence, but you actually have a flow. So in our situations, uh, so if the injectivity radius goes to zero, what we can show that while the limit will look like that, so this is on my limiting sigma h, I still get this, but we can show that the matrix G of T converge uh, without pullback by diffeomorphisms to a limit sigma H in a quite nice way. So what do we get? So first of all, how can we converge? We can really converge by just taking a difference of two tensors and taking the CK norm, so no pulling back any at all, this going to zero. And we can do this on a pretty large domain. That is important to understand. It's sort of, if, if I'm here at time T close to T, and I'm a point at this, like here, do I end up somewhere here, or do I end up being completely lost in the limiting process? So we have to understand which parts will actually pass to the limit, and which parts will be lost. So we should think about this as being some part here, this is probably lost, and then there's another part there. This is all just at the domain, this part here, and this thick part here, this is all seen, and then I have again lost parts over here. So this is lost parts of the domain, and therefore also losing you there. So all of the lost parts of the domain, you might lose a lot of information about the map there. So we have to ask, where can we converge? That G of T, H, where does this thing go to zero? So it's easy to show, certainly for every fixed delta positive, this over the thick part goes to zero when I fix my delta and let t go to, the, go to the time. Now, if this is all I have, then I might have a major problem in my flow, at least in terms of losing a lot. I can't do two, yes. But at some level, it would be good enough to continue studying the flow. So let me first try to explain, if I just know something about, I can pass to a limit, I get a limit, then how can I continue the flow? And then let me go back and collect and see that not too much has fallen out of sort of my wagon that I'm trying to push to a minimal surface.
So this kind of convergence, just any convergence of the metrics to a limiting object, which is well-defined, doesn't depend on how I approach my singular time, is good enough for me getting a limit. So this is good enough for continuation of limit of the flow as we get a limiting domain. So this limiting domain sigma h initially, and we get that the u of t converge to a limiting map, at least locally, on sigma h. Well, you can think of this sigma as a subset of n. So this works out to get a limit. You can prove this. And here again, it's nice up to bubbling. So I have a limiting object, and when you flow things and when you have to construct an extension after a singularity, what you really need is a canonical limit from which to restart, and this canonical limit should please be nice. Now, this is not nice, because this is not compact. And flowing on non-compact surfaces is not really a nice thing to do. However, if you remember that we said, well, we have symmetries we can take out, then I can make this look much nicer. So conformally, this looks, well, not quite compact yet, but not much is missing. So I have a twice punctured sphere, I have a once punctured torus. Now what we do, we have the ma maps defined here. So the only kind of surgery intervention we have to do is we just say we wipe away these three points. And this is what I restart with. So I'm restarting with sigma nu and g of t. So we get this locally. We take this, turn it into a new sigma with g of t, and then we can continue flow, flowing. So that's what you can do. And you can continue doing this. You might run into more of these singularities, but because you lose genus each time, you will not encounter too many of them. So you can do this all the way to infinity. And you can do a similar analysis when you actually go to infinity and say, well, again, I might have convergence to an object which looks like this. But if I look at it, what I get is a map on a compact surface defined there, and it will have the right properties. So this is an important step, but not everything yet in what you can call sort of the main result that I want to present here. So this is joint work I said with Peter Topping starting in 2012. The last paper was finished in 2018. And for the asymptotics part, it's also additionally joined with Miao Miao Zhu and uh, joined with Tobias Huxel. And what the theorem tells us is that given any closed surface, as said, without loss of generality oriented, for any compact Riemannian manifold, NGN, no restriction on dimension at all here, and for every initial data, we have that there exists a unique solution of our flow, which we call Teichmüller harmonic map flow. And this unique solution is smooth from finitely many times away from. And as time goes to infinity, I have that sorry, a long suitable sequence T 
Tj go into infinity, we have that my object u g of Tj converge to a limiting object. So this limiting object will be u infinity, g infinity, which is I dot defined u infinity goes from m into n or from a new sigma into n because we might have changed the topology in the meantime. So we have that this converges to this where u infinity is going to be branched minimal immersion or of course just a constant. Now that's excluded depending on what you preserve some of the topology, in particular you preserve the action on the first, uh, on the fundamental group, so you might not run into a constant in general. So that's the sort of first part of the, of the theorem. That's the rough picture. Because now you could say, well, it might just be I start with a u0, I run the flow, I lose basically all of the information in a really bad way, and yeah, I end up with something which is a critical point of area, which is the constant map, so what? I haven't gained anything. So the second part of the theorem tells us that this is actually not what happens. But rather I can go back in this analysis and do a very careful analysis on the lost part to see that also on these lost parts, everything we lose are actually minimal spheres. Or in this situation, minimal spheres and one-dimensional objects, some curves. So the second part of the theorem just tells us that indeed this is, we get these minimal immersions, we lose some more minimal surfaces, but if we keep track of everything we lose and that we get in the end, what we have done is we have decomposed our starting surface into lots of minimal surfaces and a few curves. So here continues and all we lose at either finite time singularities or in the asymptotic convergence um, are minimal omega k's from the sphere and in the case of injectivity radius going to zero and curves. So the upshot of this is that if we collect everything omega k's and add in the u infinity, then we can get, we can sort of glue them together with some cylinders in the domain. So of course if I collect the omega k's, I should also collect the s2's and here I have the sigma, so in the, in the domain I glue in cylinders between my spheres and my sigma, and then I need some corresponding curves in the target, in the map component, to get a limiting object uh, so to get a map which is homotopic to what we started with. So in a sense, this is when you start with a general map, this is sort of the best you can hope for because in a lot of situations you will not have anything which is homotopic directly to your U0 and which is a minimal surface. There's of course very simple examples if you just take an example of a map from a cylinder into Euclidean space, so here's my domain, that is also something we can do. If I go into Euclidean space, then I would ask for plateau boundary conditions. So I would ask that this maybe spans two circles, so this one is the image of this one, this is the image of this. 
Then of course, if I pull them far apart, I don't have a cutenoid in there. So my limiting configuration should really be looking like disc, disc, and the line, and that's what the flow does. It will change your cylinder, it will change this domain to turn it into something which is very long. In this situation, we also flow with hyperbolic objects, so you get some very, very long cylinders, which are basically, in the end, just punctured discs. And you will see on this punctured disc, you will see this guy, on this punctured disc, you will see this guy, and on the sort of lost part, you will see the sphere. Uh, you will see, see the line. I'm not sure, I have to say. I would need to think about it. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I would need to think about it because yeah, there's a. The yes, yes. Yeah. Right. So for this last part, let me try to explain where this last part comes from. And let me do this by drawing even more pictures, just because I'm drawing pictures is fun. So how do we account? for the lost part when injectivity radius goes to zero. I briefly alluded to it before, we need to understand exactly which parts are seen in the limit and which parts are lost in the limit and then hope that on the lost part some miracle happens and these things look like minimal surfaces. So how does that work? So first of all, I know that if I look at delta thin of a surface, g of t for delta small, this is just part of a, of a union of hyperbolic cylinders. And because I'm hyperbolic, these cylinders can be described very precisely. These cylinders will be of a form minus x of l, x of l cross s1, l the length of the corresponding geodesic, and then some rho squared that depends on L ds squared plus d theta squared, where this L scales like pi over L. So if I forget for a moment that I have a hyperbolic surface, I can just draw the picture in the corresponding Euclidean cylinder situation to try to understand what happens. So I have these two settings. I have hyperbolic cylinders here. This is my hyperbolic cylinder where stuff happens. And this corresponds to a Euclidean cylinder down here. So I'm just going to go back and forth as I like it. This is conformal to each other. So this is one of the bits which you can imagine here. So for example, this part. So the very ends of this will be red, will be seen afterwards. So I really don't have to worry about what the map does here. So this is seen. And the middle bit somewhere is lost. So the very thin part will definitely be lost. So the question is how far out do I have to go to know for sure that I'm seen? And then there's also the question of what would I actually like the lost set to be? So let's maybe start with that. So how could we ever hope to get good, com good control on a lost tiny little cylinder? Now, if you look at the behavior of the tension when you do a conformal change, then while the energy is conformally invariant, the tension is not. So changing a conformal factor and having a tension relatively small with respect to something with a tiny conformal factor tells you really good information because of this scaling. So let's try to get one down. So if I'm here, if I'm very, very thin, and very thin depends on how close to the singular time I want to be, then I will look like a harmonic map. And the reason for this is if I just change the metric with respect to which I compute tension, I get extra factors in. So let me note that if I look at the tension of any map 
with respect to the hyperbolic metric, so of this form rho squared times the Euclidean metric over L2 delta thin of such a hyperbolic cylinder. Then this is less than rho, uh, sorry, delta times the tangent of over the same domain with respect to the Euclidean metric. When I do everything Euclidean here. So same domain, I gain a factor delta, delta being the injectivity radius. It's like a rescaling. So if my flow becomes singular, well, what do we know? Very likely, the tension with respect to the hyperbolic metric of u shoots off to infinity. So in general, something having tangent going to infinity isn't something you would call, it looks like a harmonic map. It looks pretty far away from a harmonic map. But if I rescale it and then look at it at the, sorry, I, this is not good news, this is the other way around. The Euclidean tangent is of course bounded by the hyperbolic tangent. Sorry. So, yeah. So if I go to the Euclidean tangent, I get my extra factor of delta in there. So now if I have a flow which becomes singular, I have the hyperbolic tangent going off to infinity. But if I choose this delta small enough, this might still force the Euclidean tangent to go to zero. So how small do I have to choose delta? We know that we have a gradient flow. So that tells me that the integral of tangent of u L2 squared, this is still finite. So I cannot blow up at the rate which is more than roughly square root of the time remaining. So at least along most goes to T, I have that the tangent with respect to the hyperbolic metric, L2 behaves like a little o of one over square root T minus Tj. So if I choose delta as this, I'm okay. Because then I will cancel this thing out. Oops, this is front. So what I get is that not on delta thin, but on L delta t, which is square root t minus t thin, I'm going to have that the tangent along most subsequences particular along some subsequence Tj, L2 with Euclidean, this is less than square root T minus Tj times little o of 1 over square root T minus Tj. So this is basically going to zero. So my map looks nearly, nearly harmonic. So that tells me on the little bit here, here on the lost part, I can distinguish between some bits. I have some bits where I'm already okay. I know that if I have my injectivity rate is very small, I'm okay. So I have a new region here, map nearly harmonic. And this map nearly harmonic is square root t minus t. And now, of course, comes the question, can I extend the red part to overlap with the orange part? So do I have an overlap between the stuff which looks nearly harmonic and the things which I see? Then I would be very happy. Or do I have a major gap? Because at the moment, all we know is that if I fix a delta, then here, injectivity radius delta fixed. That's definitely seen but there's still quite a gap between fixed number and something that goes to zero. Now the good news is this extends quite a bit into here. So I have this overlap and the seen part is the T minus T, J thing. So all the way to time remaining to the singular time, 
I actually see the thing in my limit, and in particular, the lost part is very firmly in the region where I control tension. So this means in practice that I have a lost region, but in the lost region, my thing looks like a harmonic map, and then I can carry out analysis and see that if I have something which is basically a harmonic map, so if I look at now just this, this bit, I have a harmonic map on sort of a Euclidean cylinder, does that look like a bunch of minimal surfaces? And the answer to this is it does. You might have some parts here where the energy is greater than epsilon, maybe some parts here as well. And if you rescale these parts, you get more bubbles. You either get bubbles which come from cylinders. So we know that also a cylinder is basically a sphere without two points. So it might be if I have quite a lot of energy, I look at a chunk of this and I see a minimal sphere. Or it might be here I have a lot of energy, but it's because I have a really tiny little ball on which I have loads of energy. Then I rescale again up to the, to the plane, so I get bubbles like that. And then in between here, there's the low energy region. And there you can show that U is roughly like a curve. And what you really show is that the oscillation over circles S1 of U is tiny this goes to zero, so the U really looks like a curve, a one-dimensional object. In particular, it will not be able to carry any sort of two-dimensional topological information in it. And that's sort of the end of what you need to do, because this is all you can lose in this situation. Now, as often in mathematics, this is sort of the complicated analysis. You do this, and you have absolutely no idea whether you actually need to do it because it might just be the flow never develops singularities of this form. And our sort of mood of do we actually have to do this was oscillating quite a bit. So you can actually prove that all of this is completely unnecessary if your target has negative curvature or just generally supports no bubbles, then the injectivity radius will not go to zero in finite time. In infinite time, it can still go to zero. The example is just a cylinder that I had up there, that still needs to go to zero. But at the same time, there's a mechanism which can drive such a finite time singularities where you have these low energy regions having to map to very, very long curves because you have parts which are sort of trying to go off to infinity and dragging things behind. And so I showed in a paper last year with my student, Craig Robertson, that actually this is not unnecessary, but you need this because singularities of this form can occur. And with this, I thank you for your patience. And well, thank you for finishing on time. I didn't have to hold up any of my 10 minute things or anything. Oh, should I have a comment? Uh, on? No. <laughs> on, yes, I think it probably is on, yes. <laughs> so, do we have any questions or comments? Yeah, yeah, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh. My question was can you do it in a one parameter family? Because in a hyperbolic manifold, this theorem, it seems like you could just get a bunch of arcs. So. Yeah, so you can definitely flow a, a family. The question is at which point does this family become discontinuous? So if you have any bubbling occurring, even with harmonic map flow, you would not expect if you have a one parameter family, you can have bits and pieces of them running into finite time singularities. And then, of course, after that time, you will not have a continuous family of them. But uh, the, the question to then ask is in nice situations where you don't have bubbles and you, don't, you have control on injectivity radius. And then the thing you have to talk about is whether not just you have a, a unique solution, uh, sorry, you have a unique continuation, but also whether when you go to time infinity, you actually converge in a nice way. And the answer is yes, you converge in a nice way. And if you have a nice target, namely an analytic target, 
and the right conditions, and that should be on archive later this summer. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, may I add a, just a small, short, small question? Uh, so uh, can you bound the lengths of these necks that you produce? Uh, the, in the image or in the domain? Uh, on the domain, like the, if you, I mean, basically it's like a small tube. So the question mm -hmm. is, can you bound the length of this tube? Uh, so in the domain, this will go to, this will go to infinity, the length, because it is related to the length of the central geodesic by basically a lock. So the, the intrinsic diameter of the surface goes to infinity as lock L, when L goes to zero. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Any more questions? Oh. I think I need water I first. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks. So, 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 following up on Aaron's question, so are, do, do the images get close to geodesics in the ambient manifold? Good question. So, so. That's still that's one of the things I still don't know. Okay. Uh, it's a bit tricky because when you look at so when you look at harmonic maps from the generating hyperbolic uh, colors, they will converge to bubbles and geodesics. Mm. If you look at general almost harmonic maps from the generating hyperbolic colors, you can get any old curve, mm. parameterize it with tiny tension. There's an in-between statement there, which is you can prove the things converge to um, geodesics if you have the right relationship between injectivity radius and sort of the, the tension. But uh, I don't know whether that whether the flow does that or not. It's yeah. So, so, so my other question was, it, it, for area, there for high genus, there's a the Douglas condition, and I'm just wondering. And I guess that works probably for energy too. I think that's the way it originally was doing it. Is there some analog where if you if you can establish a Douglas condition, so you don't get splitting, that you get convert good convergence without getting the... Uh, yes, there's, I mean, the, the simple situation, for example, if you go, I mean, it's not the minimal surfaces, but sort of a nice little thing. So if I take, if you take your favorite sort of analog type domain in the plane, then you can ask yourself whether we can use the flow to get the biholomorphic map between the standard analogs. So the standard analysis, of course, corresponds just to a cylinder. And in this situation, you can use the flow to get the biholomorphic map if your initial energy u0 is less than or equal d. So this is, if this is the area of the analysis plus two times the area of the hole, then you will already know for sure that the flow converges along, not even with a passing to subsequence, but in a nice way. Okay, any more questions or comments? Okay, if not, let's um, thank Melanie again, and I'm gonna pass you over to Eric.